Hey fearsome friends, I've got some pretty gnarly stories in today's episode, so be warned. One of them too isn't true, so see if you can guess which one and let me know in the comments. Now without further ado, sit back, relax, and get cosy comfy warm, because it's time to let your nightmares in. Warning. This story is graphic, and has mention of blood, gore, and death. If you're not comfortable with such things, don't listen. So I feel I should start off by saying that I'm not a violent person, and the thought of killing mortifies me. But this all happened during a dinner party that was being hosted by my Laotian neighbours. They're the nicest, most hospitable people on the face of the planet, and this was one of their bigger parties, meaning they had all kinds of friends and family over. Mostly family, though. Now, I live roughly a quarter of a mile up from them on a gravel road in the countryside. And another important detail is that I'd recently purchased a pistol grip shotgun, and I wanted to show it off. Once the party had really taken off, mind you, I don't drink, I had taken it out and was showing it off to my neighbour and a few relatives and friends. When just then, I noticed a mostly naked man, in just his undies, walking slowly into the driveway. I pointed him out to everyone, so we decided to go see if he was okay. However, before we could move, he bolted towards our little group and tackled me to the ground, tearing a chunk out of my shoulder, then beginning to eat it before I knew what was happening. My screaming caught everyone's attention, and the son of my neighbour, who was in the military, pried the guy off me, but lost his grip due to the man thrashing about like a wounded animal. Several people were calling the cops, and others were trying to restrain the crazed man. I think it was my neighbour who was holding something on my bloody shoulder. I don't know what I was thinking in that moment, but I made my way to my truck with my new gun in hand and proceeded to load it. Once I made my way back towards the crazed man, he broke loose and made for the wife of my neighbour. But he was thrown to the ground by the blast of my shotgun, and I wasted no time in putting two more shells in his chest. However, this didn't seem to faze him at all, as I looked down the barrel of my gun, down at him. In that moment, I got a good look. He had this look on his face, and it was that of something no longer human as cliché as that sounds. He looked more like some crazed and hungry animal. He tried to get up, but I tackled him to the ground, stood up, and blew his head off. I'm not entirely sure what had happened immediately afterwards, as I passed out from blood loss. But when I awoke, I was in the local hospital, and when the doctors and nurses all saw I was awake, they did all manner of tests, and asked me questions, etc., but then the police came and questioned me, and I told them everything I remembered. I asked a few questions of my own, and found out that the guy had copious amounts of different drugs in his system, such as methamphetamines and bath salts, as well as several others I don't remember. Luckily I was in no legal trouble, due to all the witnesses present, and I ended up undergoing a bit of surgery to replace the chunk from my shoulder. My family and neighbours all came to visit me, and even smuggled in some actually good food. I guess this just goes to show, anything can happen at any time. When I was 16, which feels like eons ago, I started going to a high school that had a public library in it. Upon entering the front doors of the school, there was a wide hallway with the entrance to the library being a straight walk from the school entrance, so it wasn't like outsiders had to walk through the halls to get to it. But it really bothered me that anyone with a library card could be in our school at any given moment that it was open, even if they were only supposed to check out books or use a computer. Having said that, though, I rarely saw adults that weren't school employees in the library during school hours. 
My family didn't always have the electricity on, much less the internet, so I would often stay after school to do my homework in the library, where I could use the computers. The librarian's desk was in the middle of the library, and there were maybe two dozen computers off to one side, in four or five rows. Other than that, there were a few small rooms where the book club would meet, or someone could study privately, which were locked up when not in use. One afternoon, I had a research essay to do. I think it was about Homer's Odyssey. So I had asked my dad to pick me up two hours after school ended. I went to the library immediately after my last class and chose a computer close to the librarian's desk. Blissfully, only the librarian and I were in the room. I was really pleased to be able to work quietly and started plugging away at my assignment. Thirty minutes into writing, I heard the doors of the library open. I didn't look up, but I could hear a man speaking boisterously to the librarian, with her responding in a very chummy way. They were chatting like they knew each other very well, yucking it up, so to speak. Then after a few minutes of chatting, the librarian excused herself. I can't remember if I heard her say why, but she bustled out of the room and didn't return before I left, more than an hour later which hadn't happened before. Now I can't say for sure, but I'm almost positive that she was supposed to not leave the library unattended while it was open. They actually closed it when she took lunch sometimes, because I'd seen the back in X minutes sign on the door previously. Almost as soon as the librarian left, this adult man decided to use a computer. Being that we were the only two people using them, You would think he would have sat nowhere near me, right? But he sat one chair away from my right. I could see from the corner of my eye that he was a very large man in every sense of the word. But otherwise, he looked like your average nine-to-five guy. Polo shirt, khakis, generic black framed glasses. After the first peripheral glance, I tried to avoid looking over at this guy. I also told myself that the librarian knew him, so he's probably okay. Just some dude checking his email. Nothing to be paranoid about. But inside I was screaming, creep alert. As I was continuing to research for my essay and make notes, I started hearing this guy giggle in between clicking the mouse. At first it was quiet, but he was chortling with gusto within a minute. I didn't want to but I felt my whole head turn to look at this guy's computer. His monitor was showing what appeared to be a photo covered by colourful jigsaw puzzle pieces. As the guy clicked on the puzzle piece outlines, they disappeared, revealing the picture underneath. When I first looked at it, the picture was completely visible, except for two pieces. The image was a studio-quality photo of an oily, muscular, naked man posing with his arms over his head. One of the only unclicked pieces would have revealed the schlong. The creep looked over at me, still chuckling. I had the feeling he was canvassing for my reaction, which was unmasked disgust. I logged off and moved to a different computer, which I thought sent the message that he'd made me uncomfortable. I logged into my new computer, and as soon as I started typing, the guy got up, walked over and sat down next to me. I promptly stood up, kicking over my chair, unplugged the computer, I wanted to log out really fast, and ran out. My dad wasn't going to be there for another 30 minutes, so I waited in the bathroom. Whenever it was about time for me to get picked up, I walked towards the front doors to leave the school, and I decided to peek in the library. The creep was sitting at the computer still, but his body was turned to face the doors, and he was looking straight at me, grinning like a Cheshire cat. I dropped out of school that year, and this honestly played a part in that decision. I felt so vulnerable, and looking back I think that librarian might have been secretly creeped out by this guy and was playing nice in front of him. She might have made a lame excuse to leave the room so that she didn't have to entertain him, which I would understand if she wasn't leaving him alone with an underage student. I didn't trust the school to take it seriously, especially the librarian, 
and my parents wouldn't have wanted to hear it, so I didn't tell anyone. This is actually the first time I've ever told this story. I live in Denver, Colorado, and I'm a sex worker. Last year, a girl went missing in Thornton, Colorado, and was found later shot to death. This year, a few months ago, another girl went missing and was found stabbed to death, and now a girl my friend is close with has been missing since last week, and we still haven't heard from her. They're all sex workers and I'm starting to worry that this girl could be dead because of what happened to the other two. I've contacted the police already, but nothing's been done, and they still have no suspect for the shooting in Thornton. Could it be a serial killer, or am I just overthinking it? So in November of last year, the first girl went missing for a few days, and then was found dead in Thornton, which is not far out from Denver. Then in February, another one of our girls was found stabbed, and she'd been missing for almost a week before she was found dead. Last week, another girl went missing, and we still haven't heard from her at all, and we don't know if she is safe or not. We strictly work in Denver, and refuse to go out of a certain area. The girls are all in their twenties, and they had brown hair, and the girl who is currently missing has brown hair, with two blonde streaks in the front. We also know to be aware of who we get into cars with, or meet up with, and my friend and I went to the police when the third girl had gone missing. We mentioned the other murders so they could see if it was connected at all, and we said that it's urgent and she needs to be found. I'll update you if I hear anything and let you all know. My friend recently sent me a message, saying someone was following her, and that it could be related. She said he was tall had brown hair and it was styled. He was clean shaven and was wearing a suit. Someone also sent an article about a man who looked similar, but that was in Boulder. I'll put the link in the description below. This happened years ago, but still makes all the hair on the back of my neck stand up. My best friend and I, both 30-year-old females, decided to go to a bar one night that is close to her house. We have been best friends since grade 8, so about 16 years now, so we know each other pretty well. We got to the bar, got some drinks, and I met this really hot guy. He was 6'3", had a chiselled jaw and abs, the whole shebang. We were really hitting it off, and he was super into me, and as the night progressed we had more and more drinks. Then out of nowhere my girlfriend looked at him dead in the eyes and suddenly said, you're a murderer and a bad person. I was instantly shocked and confused, and asked her how she knew this. She just kept saying that she didn't know how, she just knew he was. Now this was completely out of character for her so I assumed she was just saying it because she was drunk. But I've seen her drunk many times, and she'd never behaved like this before. She admitted she had never met him, so I decided my friend was too drunk, and we should just go home. She fully agreed, and in fact pretty much dragged me out of there. The guy found me on Facebook, and asked me out a couple of times, but I couldn't get my friend's reaction out of my head, so I didn't go to meet him. Fast forward three years later, and multiple women are accusing him of violent rape after going on dates with him. I teared up thinking about it, and how if my best friend hadn't had said she'd gotten such a strong feeling about him out of nowhere, I probably would have suffered the same fate. To this day she still doesn't know where it came from, and we have talked at length about anything she might have seen that I hadn't that would have led her to what she'd concluded but she says she can't think of anything. It was just a feeling. (laughs) 
I work night shifts, so I sleep during the day. I was asleep after a 16-hour shift, and my husband shook me awake and said, We need to talk. I was confused and said, Okay. He then went on to tell me that my oldest son, we have five kids, was on his Nintendo Switch Lite playing Borderlands and had his headset on. He continued to tell me that he was trying to tell my son about how his two-year-old sister was trying to climb the baby gate earlier on, when he noticed my son's face turn upside down and look disgusted, ripping his headset off. My husband asked him what was wrong, and my son said, I was playing with this guy, and he started asking me if my parents make weird sounds, and if I want to know what they're doing when they make those sounds. Then he asked if I knew what parts girls had, and if I wanted to know what they looked like. Now I was fully awake, and absolutely livid. My husband went to see if this guy was still on my son's friends list, but the guy had blocked him. I don't know if I'm allowed to give out the game attack, but my husband was able to find it out. What we think resulted in this guy blocking our son was him hearing my husband talking to him after he'd pulled the headset off. This guy was obviously attempting to find his next victim in our son, and in my opinion, anyone, man or woman, who does this to a child is a pedo. You'd know if you've ever played a video game with a headset that you can tell the difference between a child's voice and an adult's. When we decided as parents to let him communicate with other gamers, we did educate him about these types of weirdo creeps. So no Karen or Kyle, I won't be taking his headset. I just thought I'd share as a reminder that as parents who allow our children to game, we need to check up on them periodically. Update. My son shook me awake about an hour and a half ago to let me know this creep made a new game attack and re-added and joined his game. He asked my son if my husband and I were sleeping. My son said no, and this man said, Damn. I was trying to start a conversation. At this point he's made it clear that he's targeting my son. I'm going to chat with Nintendo once they open, but if you have any other suggestions, let me know. I had an uncle that had gone to prison for many years and was sent down to Southern California where he had gotten into a fight and was put into the hole. My grandma and I went down to visit him but couldn't see him in a rec room so we had to see him through a window with a phone in a small area. When we arrived everything had gone according to plan until they said to go into a room. They buzzed the door we walked into and the door closed behind us. At the time I was around six years old and didn't understand what was happening, but my grandma knew that we had just walked into a tiny room with Charles Manson, the only thing between us being a big window. He stood in that room with him for around 30 seconds to a minute before he was taken and escorted away with a small smile and a wave. I believe he had just ended a visit with someone else and they had not switched him out with my uncle yet. To this day it creeps me out having that memory of his smile and wave. Now this is about a real place, Market Street in Port Norris, New Jersey. I was 13 when I moved there, so about 30 years ago. I turned 14 whilst there, but moved before I turned 15, and this was the scariest place I've ever lived. Yet I miss it. Looking on Google Maps and satellite view, I feel like I'm home. I wasn't the only one who had had experiences there. One I shared with my brother, but I never found out about everyone else's until long, long after we had moved. In fact, some experiences weren't discovered until recently. Firstly, I had never been to this house in my life, but knew every room. I even knew which one would be mine before ever entering the house. 
This was the most recent shared experience I discovered. But my mother had the same thing happen to her. It was a two-story home, and was supposedly over a hundred years old in 1991 when I lived there. There was a stable in the backyard that was just as old as the house, and it was huge. Off from the kitchen there was a downstairs bathroom that went largely unused, and this was because there was actually three to five stairs you would need to climb up before getting to it. But it wasn't the climbing that put us off. Directly to the right at the bottom of the stairs was another staircase leading down into a cellar. Of course that door was kept closed, and I never ever went into the cellar. Only my stepfather did. But he entered it from outside, though I'm not even sure if it was a cellar to be exact. It wasn't underground. It was only below the bathroom, even though the bathroom was off from the kitchen and the kitchen was ground level. I'm actually unsure on this, because like I said, I never went in there. Even when it was deep into the summer, and in a house without air conditioning, that bathroom stayed seriously cold and gave off a foreboding feeling. So the usual stuff happened there. Doors closing on their own, then opening. Lights going on and off, though some of the lights came on at full brightness, even though they were set to a dimmer switch. One day, my mum was working and my stepfather took my six-year-old brother out there with him. That left me and my ten-year-old brother home alone. And when I picked up the phone to call a friend, I got no dial tone. Instead, there was the signal that you'd get when there was a phone off the hook. I hung up and retried, but same deal. I left my bedroom and went to my mum's room, which is something I wasn't supposed to do, but I did anyway, so I could make sure her cordless was on the hook, and it was. I then went downstairs to the kitchen, and it was the same deal, so I went back to my room feeling very confused and quite honestly aggravated. I again tried my phone, but now I was getting chopping noises, as if someone was using an axe to cut wood. And worse than that, there was a woman screaming in the background, sounding terrified. I slammed down the phone, and after I'd called off, picked it up again, but heard the same thing. I made my rounds through all the phones in the house again, and all of them were replaying the same scene straight out of a horror movie. When I finally hung up the kitchen phone, my brother finally asked what was going on, so I told him. But he didn't believe me. So I handed him the phone and asked him what he could hear. His face went pale. He could hear it. I picked up the phone again and finally, miraculously, got a dial tone. I quickly dialed my mum at work and I told her what had been going on. She said the phone lines must have been crossed or something. So I got off the phone from her and immediately called my friend. She listened to my story and just laughed at me. She thought I was making it up. I told her how serious I was, when suddenly the phone disconnected. I stared at it. Then it rang. I picked up and it was her. That's not funny, she said. She thought I'd hung up on her. I told her I hadn't, then the phone disconnected again. I had an idea. I told my brother to go across the street and ask his friend's dad to call me, so he did. A few minutes later the phone rang, so I picked it up, and again there was chopping and screaming. I said hello several times, then gave in and hung up. My brother came back and said his friend's dad could hear me saying hello, and that his line was clear. I was done with the phone for the day. Has anyone else had anything similar happen to them? Does anyone have any ideas as to what this was? I live in a small rural community in the eastern US. It's a nice little town, and because of my work in the medical field, I've met some, let's say, interesting folks. I'm also familiar with law enforcement and emergency personnel. Small town life is not as dull and uneventful as people think. 
especially since everybody knows somebody who knows somebody else, and I have a lot of stories to share. But as this one just happened, I'll start here. An investigation is still going on, actually, so I have to be vague with some details, but I need to tell someone. I'm single and live alone, and due to a stalker, so I've had to move twice. But that story is for another time. However, it is relevant for this story for multiple reasons. The first being that I have a dog for the sake of protection, as well as have motion sensors and outdoor security cameras. The second reason being the location of my home, which is literally down the street from the fire department. I can see it from my living room window. And I'm also a couple of blocks from the police station. Now next to the fire department is the road department, which is basically a parking lot for them to park their road equipment and empty garbage trucks at nights and on weekends. But oddly, it doesn't have a security camera. Small town life, I suppose. My house sits on a hill with a good view of that side of the street, and due to the incline, the large trees in the front yard, and the half cornfield on the property next to mine, most people on the street below wouldn't notice me in the backyard unless they were actively looking, although I can see the street clearly. This incident happened Saturday evening. The county was holding its annual Independence Day spiel with a community barbecue, music and fireworks, etc. But I didn't attend, because it's just not my thing. Plus I have a dog, and the sound of fireworks could be traumatising for him. Before the big show, I took the dog out to relieve herself in the backyard. There was still at least an hour of daylight left, but the entire neighbourhood was pretty quiet, because mostly everyone was at the fairgrounds or various other holiday events. So when an unfamiliar, large, white pickup truck drove slowly down the street, I noticed it. It must have turned around at the end of the street, though, because I saw it again, moving in the opposite direction only 20 seconds later, and this time it turned into the parking lot of the road department. Now people have known to toss things into the empty garbage trucks, usually at night to avoid getting caught, because they don't want to or are unable to make the trip to the landfill themselves. Usually it's things like furniture or broken equipment, but I didn't see any of those things in the back of this truck. The driver was a somewhat stocky guy of average height, and he took three large black trash bags from the bed of his truck and tossed them one by one into the hopper of the garbage truck, then left. Now I swear I'm not one of those meddling rear window types who always thinks activity is suspicious and that their neighbours are up to no good. But something about this didn't sit right with me. Normally when I see people tossing their garbage into the trucks and leaving, I don't bother reporting it, because it's relatively harmless. But this time, I had a gut feeling, so I called the police. And if anything, they could get the guy for illegally dumping trash from a barbecue or whatever. Whilst I was on the phone with dispatch, I put my dog inside to cut down on distractions while the officers investigated, and a few minutes later, an officer arrived so I crossed the street to meet him, giving him a description of the events and pointed out which of the trucks the man had tossed the bags. The officer found the bags and took photos. Then he put on gloves and told me to stay back. The bags were tied in a knot at the top, and it took him a minute to untie one of them because of the gloves and how tight the knot was. But eventually he got it open and looked inside for a few seconds. He then twisted it closed and took a few steps back. Shit, he hissed under his breath. What? I asked. It's a body. I felt sick. I could tell he felt sick too, as I saw him grow pale, and his hand was trembling when he held the radio. Even his voice was shaking as he gave the code to dispatch. The dispatcher sounded confused when she asked him to repeat it and within ten minutes the county sheriff was on the scene. Even he looked sick at the contents of the bag. The coroner arrived about ten minutes after that, and the first officer walked me back to the house along with another one who arrived at the same time as the coroner. 
Though I showed the first cop via the app on my phone when I described the events initially, I now showed them the video on a larger screen. The camera caught footage of the truck as it drove by both times, as well as pulling into the parking lot. Though unfortunately it wasn't a clear view of the license plate, or of the man tossing the bags out of frame. We watched the footage over and over, pausing frames, and the officers took notes. Ultimately they requested this footage, as well as a copy of the files from the past week, to see if the truck had been in the area before. I've also been saving footage until the road department installs their own camera this week. Now because this is still fresh, I don't know many more details. I know the body was in pieces, but I don't know the age of the victim, the gender, cause or death or any of that. Information hasn't been released to the public yet, but I don't know if the coroner has even been able to identify the body. A police cruiser has been parked at the fire department next door for constant surveillance, in case the guy came back. But the guy who dumped the body was likely local. How else would he know he could dump there? He probably thought it'd get buried in other people's illegal trash that was accumulated over the holiday weekend, and the sanitation crew wouldn't have bothered to investigate. When I think about how this guy lives in my community, it makes me feel physically ill. To think that he had clearly scouted the area for a dump site, that it may not have been the first time this had happened, and that it could happen again. If I hadn't have called it in, if I hadn't been in the backyard at that exact moment, or if I had ignored that gut feeling, the victim would have never been found, may never had found potential justice, and their loved ones may never have closure. In fact, there's a possibility that it just might happen again to another poor soul. I hope it's not me. Dear God, please don't let it be me. I think it's time I moved again. Third time's a charm right? To preface, I've always loved watching horror movies, crime documentaries, and learning about criminals, thanks coffeehouse crime. So because of this, I'm always aware of my surroundings, and try to take note of suspicious things around me. I believe this saved my life. Two years ago, my family, mum, twin sister, baby sister, dad and grandma, and I, went to the Museum of Arts in Houston. They wanted to sit at the cafe to feed my baby sister, so my twin sister and I decided to explore the different art galleries. As we passed by a lead hallway, we came to a stop near the exit doors to decide whether or not to wait for the family or to continue. Here I noticed a man in an orange jacket facing the corner, writing something in a small notepad. At that point we both decided to head back, and that's when we noticed that this dude was following behind us. Looking at each other we started walking a bit faster, and went a different direction. We made it back to the cafe and went to sit down. Then a few minutes later, the same dude walked up to our table and sat right next to us. Internally I was freaking out, and when I think back in this moment, I would have confronted his ass and said something, but as a 16 year old girl, I can see why some people are afraid to speak up. I took a picture of him and sent it to a few of my friends, but I didn't have the courage to say anything to my family at that moment. He sat there for maybe 30 to 40 minutes before getting up and leaving. He didn't show up for the rest of the time we were there until the very last moment. Side note. If you parked in the parking garage, you had to wait in line to pay for the ticket. So while we were waiting, the same dude came up to me and tapped me on my back, asking me if I spoke Spanish and if I could help him fix his car. Of course I went to go stand next to my mum, but I wholeheartedly believe that this man had bad intentions and if it were not for my observations and paranoia, I probably wouldn't be here today. So to anyone hearing this, please bring a form of self-protection. Pepper spray, tasers, alarms, anything that can potentially save your life.
So I somehow just recently discovered Reddit and feel like this is a good place to share a story that's been bothering me for years. It still creeps me out to this day. Back in my freshman year of high school, which is about 10 years ago, my sister and I were walking home from the bus stop through an orchard in Clovis, California, right next to our house, like we did every day. It was right off a freeway next to an overpass, and there was an obvious homeless presence in the orchard. Keep in mind it was poorly maintained, so you'd commonly find junk lying around. One day we noticed a doll and a mattress, as well as some kids' clothing, and decided to check it out. A few rows down I found this plain white five-gallon bucket with a lid on it, tucked in next to one of the orange trees. This thing was heavy, but I managed to pull it out and remember that as I was trying to get the lid off, it tipped over, opening up and pouring out what was quite obviously badly decomposed blood and bones. The smell was so horribly rancid, and I'll never forget it. The bones seemed more like a small human than an animal, but I was honestly so creeped out, I wasn't sticking around to get a good look. Fearing for our lives, we ran home and told our parents, who then called 911. Where we found it was close enough to our house that I could see the police had blocked it off and the crime scene investigators were there. But they never asked to speak to me directly and never followed up with my parents on what on earth was in the bucket. I don't remember ever seeing anything in the news and I tried looking into it when I got older but never found anything. What the hell could it have been? I grew up in a small town in Alabama, and when I was 18, a little while after I'd graduated from high school, I started dating a guy who was in his early 20s and lived in a nearby city. He was a very handsome, tall, muscular male that we'll call Sean for this story. He told me on our first date that he used to be a part of a very well-known gang in the United States. He explained that he'd only been a part of this gang in his younger years because he'd grown up in a bad area and didn't really have any other options. He also had proof of being in said gang, including being aware of any gang signs associated with them and having tattoos too. Which I did Google to see if they were the actual tattoos and signs for them. I had to check, as I know that there are people who like to lie about being ex-gang members and the like, just to seem cool. But Sean didn't seem like the type to lie about that kind of thing, so I gave him the benefit of the doubt, because he didn't really give me any bad vibes. He was always a gentleman to me, and treated me very well. So of course I didn't really suspect anything bad about him. However, we dated for a few weeks before the night that I found out the truth. One night I was staying over at Sean's apartment, and everything was pretty normal. This was the first time I'd ever stayed the night at his place, as I tend to be a bit cautious. But regardless of his background, it wouldn't have mattered. I just don't really like staying over in people's homes until I get to know them a bit more, and I have at least a three-date rule. I'd also been too busy before that to really stay over at his house. So that night when I was staying over, Sean's best friend was visiting for a bit, and that's when the red flag started to show. It seemed weird to have a friend over when the girl you are seeing is staying over for the first time, and it was revealed to me in private that Sean's friend was another ex-gang member from a well-known gang that is the enemy to the gang Sean had been part of. Of course I can accept that all people have their backstories, but it was definitely just a weird thing to suddenly tell me out of the blue. Additionally, Sean had not even told me that his friend would be at the apartment that day in the first place. Sean's friend did corroborate that he and and Sean were both ex-gang members, by the way. After Sean's friend had left, we were hanging out in his room. This guy had a literal arsenal in there, and I'm not exaggerating when I say he had enough weaponry to arm a small army. This included things like grenades, bulletproof vests, and an AK-47 or at least a gun similar to it, 
just to name a few that he had in his room. Needless to say, that was the second red flag of the day. That night we were in bed together, and I can't remember what led into him revealing to me what he did, but he confessed that he was in fact still a part of the gang. So, of course, I was immediately giving him this look, like, I'm sorry, what? He proceeded to go on and tell me that he was actually a hitman for the gang, and while he hadn't been active as one lately, he would still accept jobs if they were offered to him. The entire time he was telling this, he just looked me dead in the eyes with the most deadpan casual look. There was no feeling in his eyes, and he spoke like he was talking about the weather. It was extremely creepy, and I knew right then that this guy was a straight-up sociopath. I don't doubt that he was lying. I've met people who tried to get clout by lying about things like this, and he was definitely not one of them. I stayed the rest of the night, then left the next morning and never spoke to him again. I was definitely not going to keep on dating someone like that. There's not really anything left to the story as he never really tried to contact me after that. I'm sure some people will probably wonder why I didn't just leave right after he'd told me he was a hitman, but I didn't think it was a good idea to react strongly and immediately storm out of the apartment. But I also didn't actually feel like he was a danger to me personally. He did, however, definitely have the vibe of someone who had killed people. And the reason I recognised that kind of vibe is another story. He was always very polite to me, but regardless, there was no way I was going to keep dating him no matter how hot he was. So I take my dad's ashes up to Glacier National Park every year. I lived in Colorado when this story happened and I was headed south through Idaho after I had visited Montana. My car broke down in Salmon, Idaho, and a nice man stopped to help me out. I was headed through the mountain to Boys to visit a friend, and it was about a five-hour drive before I entered the truly mountainous section of Idaho. I saw a hot spring on the side of this two-lane highway along the Salmon River and decided to take a dip after the stress of having my car breaking down. The hot spring had a bathhouse up at the top near the road, and a wheelchair ramp that went down to the area near the springs that were on the side of the river. People had created little bath-shaped sections in the river that were separated by river stones, and you could actually sit in a spot that was shaped like a hot tub, so that it held the water from the hot springs while the river rushed over it. I got out of my car and headed down to the hot spring, taking my dog with me too. It was twilight, and about every half an hour a car passed by. Knowing that I was essentially alone, I took off my top and sat in the hot spring. I took a photo of a car approaching, that eventually pulled up next to mine in front of the bathhouse. It was a truck, with three men inside. Seamlessly, one man got out of the driver's side, and two men got out of the passenger side. They moved without qualms, and were covered in heavy black gear. They looked like hunters. I couldn't see the expressions on their faces, as the driver headed down the wheelchair ramp towards me with no hesitation. He was taking big long strides, and at that point I felt in danger. The two passengers from the other side of the car headed down the steep bank along the wheelchair ramp, taking a shortcut, and I was stuck in between both parties. Hastening, I hid and dressed myself under water, whilst my dog growled. He never growls. I've only heard him all of twice in my life, and this was the second time. The driver kept on walking towards me, out onto the rocks and into the river, continuously walking towards me even though he was covered in heavy gear that could get him waterlogged if he fell in the water. The other two passengers were also walking out on the rocks, directly in front of me, and the driver got so close that I had to grab my dog before he lashed out at him. I was freaking out. The man was walking out onto the stones so that he could reach me and wasn't hesitating. 
I couldn't see his face. I grabbed my phone, my keys and my clothes, and dragged my dog in between the two parties. My heart was in my ears. However, the driver wouldn't stop. He turned around quickly, making an arc, coming for me still, and was still taking big strides. The passengers were walking towards me as well, so I was trapped in between them. I ran up the bank, dragging my dog pretty much by his collar all the way into my car, and the only way that I could get into my car without them grabbing me was by throwing my dog into the back and lunging myself into the passenger side door. I threw my keys into the ignition and turned them just as the men were walking between my car and theirs. I happened to hit the lock button on the door right when they walked up, before anything else happened, or before I saw their faces, and I ended up throwing myself into the driver's seat, reversing, then hightailing it out of there. I drove about twenty minutes down the road, crossed the river on a bridge, and hid my car behind a bank near other campers. It was well hidden from the main road, and the campers were looking at me, wondering what was going on. I sat and waited. Then another ten minutes passed by, and lo and behold, the truck finally drove by. The hunters were looking for me. I managed to wait another half an hour, and then drove up to the mountains, over to Boys, and back to safety. The first time I learned about a camera obscura was when I went into this old abandoned theatre. It was this big old hall, kind of empty and echoey, and there was mildew here and there which made me sneeze. The ceiling was one of those rounded deals with a bump in the middle. Looked like a giant mouldy boob if you looked at it from the right angle. Well there was this pinprick in the top of the boob. Bigger than a real pinprick, mind you. It was actually a hole and along the ceiling was a picture of outside. I sat there in the damp theatre seats, staring up at the image for a good long while, when I saw Billy Thumpkin digging into his nose as he crossed the road. He damn near got hit by Mr Hawling's big Cadillac too. But he made it, and I just sat there watching the whole ordeal from the comfort of the hall. I was so taken in by the place, that I decided right then and there to try and make my own, because, you know, Something ain't yours unless you steal it and make it so. That's what my old pappy used to say anyway. So I went home and started poking holes in things, and then looking into them to see if I could see the world. The first thing was a cardboard shoebox. It took a little figuring out, and I liked to tinker. But when I finally saw that image, I thought, damn, the world looks all cardboard-like, and that got me thinking about what a world looks like inside of other things. Then I heard my cat meowing, and thought I'd give that a try. But cats are wild critters, ornery and wicked. She scratched my lips bloody when I poked a hole in her fur, and I knew I'd have to use something more docile, something calmer that wouldn't hurt me. So that night I grabbed the shovel from the shed and went digging. Luckily we hadn't buried Grandma that deeply, as the town always charges you for the depth you bury your loved ones, and we didn't have any money. So she was basically just thrown on the ground, and we let nature cover her up. That was about ten years ago though, so I had to dig a little, but not enough to even break a sweat. And there she was, just bones and bits and pieces of her nightgown. I dusted off her skull and got to work. Soon I was staring into Grandma's skull, trying to see the sunrise, and it took me a while of course. At first I saw only darkness, but then a picture came into view slowly, and I saw Granny's grave, and all her bones. The only thing was, her bones were reassembling themselves, and soon her bony hand began reaching for me, and I heard her whisper, Give me that back.
Now, if I remember correctly, this must have happened around 2014, 2015. Myself and my group of friends were 15, 16 at the time, and we were in our local town in the east of England, shopping, which at the time would consist of us trying to find somewhere that would serve us alcohol. It must have been autumn, as I remember us being wrapped up, and it was getting dark pretty early as we walked around. Eventually we got our hands on some vodka and skittles, which we added to the bottle. I would not recommend. Then we headed to the large park in the centre of town. This park was fairly well lit on its many paths, but being nervous underage drinkers, we headed as far into the open grass as possible, so as to not be seen. I don't remember any of us noticing anyone around as we entered, which made sense, as it was getting darker and was a chilly evening. We sat in a circle, about six of us, all girls, and passed around the bottle and played some drinking games. We spent about half an hour there, and were getting more raucous as we drank and laughed, when all of a sudden I heard a phone ring. I asked whose it was, as I didn't recognise the tone, and everyone looked to their backs but couldn't find the source. We then noticed in the distance, closer to the path, that maybe about ten metres away, there was a silhouette. Whoever this was, they put their hand in their pocket and took out a phone. This was the source of the ringing. We all went silent as we watched this figure's movements, and attempted hurriedly to shove our belongings into our bags and get to our feet. But before we were all ready to move away, the person started walking towards us. I mostly remember one friend shouting, Run! and we all followed her lead. At first being lazy and a little drunk, I wondered whether doing this was really necessary. It was probably just someone telling us to leave. The closest exit to the park was up a steep hill, and trying to keep pace with my friends, I looked behind me to where the higher elevation of where we had run to gave a good view of the whole area we had been sitting on. I was hoping to see this stranger back on the path, and any reservations I had with our reaction was instantly dissipated when I saw the figure sprinting after us, full pelt up the hill. I shouted that we were being chased, and none of us looked behind us or slowed until we were out of the park and some distance down the well-lit street. We never worked out exactly what had happened that night, but I remember that I definitely didn't tell my mum. A year or two later, a man was stabbed to death in that park in an unprovoked attack. I think I had made myself forget this incident somewhat. Until finding that out. I'm going to throw all of the memories that still scare me to this day and this one is definitely the scariest. It's not supernatural, and it doesn't involve cryptids, but it was very much a scary situation that I'd gotten myself into. So I lived a life that wasn't based off morality. I did a lot of bad, and that bad put me in bad situations at times. But this one particular situation could have been the end of my time on Earth had I been standing at a different angle. One night, my brother and I were at my main spot, the place I laid my head, and as usual, I had the front door open so I could see people walking up. My brother was outside doing I don't know what, and I was inside playing GTA 5 on my new Xbox One. After about 20 minutes, he came in to let me know that there'd been a car parked across the street for the last 15 minutes or so, so I made sure everything was in my stash spot put the game on pause, and picked up my 45. At the time, I was the man, and was taking everyone's business, and even though I tried to remain low-key, everybody knew what I was doing, so I had plenty to worry about. I had seen rivals eyeing my spot plenty of times. People who also competed for the same area weren't too happy about what I was doing. But my customers, even though I trusted most of them, could have always been plotting something, or jealous exes. I never knew. So I grabbed my gun, and before I went out I checked the camera,
just to make sure there was no one hiding in my yard, and I headed out. I went out the first gate, and kind of just stood there smoking a cigarette. I was trying to see if I recognised the car first before anything else. It was an older model car, dark tinted windows, and it was running, but the lights were off. I concluded that I'd never seen it before, so I threw my cigarette out, took my gun out from my pants, and put it in my left hand. The car was parked to the right, so I didn't want them to see what I had when I walked up. So me and my brother started walking towards it. Suddenly the door flew open, and my hand twitched as a natural reaction, as if to take aim and fire. But I paused, and my blood ran cold when the person came out. You got a problem, was all I heard, and I was stuck. It was a police officer, in full uniform. His girlfriend lived at the corner house, and I guess he was just waiting for her. But anyway, meanwhile I was fumbling with the gun, and I managed to slip it in my back pocket, which was just big enough to hold the gun without it falling, and I started walking backwards, scared to tell him that, no, I didn't. I was just checking if everything was okay, etc. He kind of just stared at me, pissed off. Maybe he was watching my house. Maybe he was waiting on his girlfriend. But whatever it was, had I walked up with the gun in the wrong hand, or at the wrong angle, or been wearing pants with no pockets, or a thousand other different variables, he would have had every right to put me down, no questions asked. At the time it was scary, but even though all these years have passed since then, it gets scarier every time I think about it. I was inches and seconds away from death. Had one thing been different that day, it had been over. If I wasn't right-handed, I would have been done for. What I do believe, though, is that someone was watching over me that day, and he wasn't about to let me out of our deal that easy. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed my video. And if you did, could you please give me virtual hugs by subscribing and clicking that notifications button. I also have a Patreon page and YouTube channel membership if you'd like to support me further. Thank you again for being here. Keep being creepy.